So the story of the Melchizedek goes back into the early chapters of Genesis when Abram, who would eventually become Abraham, but not yet, and his wife Sarai, who would eventually become Sarah, but not yet, Abram and Sarai leave their home in what would be modern-day Iraq, and they travel uh, to what would become modern-day Israel. They're traveling, they're moving with Abram's nephew, Lot, and his wife. But this isn't just four people going off on a walk. Uh, Abram and Lot were incredibly wealthy men. Now, Wealth back then didn't involve bank accounts because there was no such thing. It didn't involve currency because in 2500 BC there wasn't currency either. Wealth was, you know, determined by how much gold you have or precious metals or precious gemstones, but principally it was determined by how many sheep were in your flock and how many cattle were in your herd. And Abram and Lot had a lot of sheep and a lot of cattle. We're probably talking um, high hundreds, low thousands of cattle, and we're probably talking several thousand uh, sheep, each of them. Now, Abram and Sarai and Lot and his wife aren't managing thousands and thousands of animals by themselves. They have people to do this. They have employees. They have shepherds and herdsmen and probably hundreds, each of them, to manage their thousands of animals. And then their shepherds and herdsmen would be traveling with their wives and children. So when we say that Abram and Lot moved from Iraq to, to Israel. This isn't like a small affair. This is a massive caravan of people and animals thundering across the plain. Finally, they arrived into what would become Israel, was then called Canaan, and they began to settle down. The problem was, when you have that many people, that many children, that many sheep and uh, cattle and probably some uh, uh, camels and uh, donkeys thrown in for good measure, that's a lot of mouths to feed. Uh, and Lot's shepherds and herdsmen were concerned only with their employer's animals. They wanted to, Lot's men wanted to make sure that Lot's animals were healthy and were thriving and were multiplying. They couldn't care at all about Abrams. And so when you have that many mouths to feed, resources are stretched and they begin fighting over the resources. And then the people begin fighting. And you don't need to be a biblical scholar. You just need to know just a little bit about um, human relations to know that then this family was fighting with this family and this family wasn't talking to this family. And Everything was a mess. So Abram, as the uncle, probably felt like he needed to be the bigger person. And so Abram went to Lot and said, okay, look, this isn't working out. So why don't you pick a place, any place, pick a place to go, and wherever you pick, I'll go in the other direction. I'll find somewhere else, but I'll give you first pick. And so Lot looks around, and he sees the area around the Dead Sea called the Jordan Valley. And uh, the Jordan Valley is, at this point, opulent. It is uh, incredibly wealthy, incredibly resourced. There's five cities of the Jordan Valley. Each of those cities has its own king. And each of those cities uh, are economically booming uh, because they have tar. There are these massive tar pits. In fact, to this day, uh, if you're by the Dead Sea, all of a sudden a like huge uh, glop of tar will bob to the surface because the land is just you know bubbling up with the stuff. And we might go, ew, but back then tar was incredibly valuable. You couldn't make a boat without tar. There were uh, countries and tribes all over 
the Mediterranean basin that were doing business with those five cities of the Jordan Valley to get their tar. And so they had lots of resources, lots of money. They had a nice mall, a multiplex theater, and Lot said, that's where I want to go. I want to go where, where it's happening. And so Abram says, fine. And so Abram uh, goes off to another place called the Oaks at Mamre, and Lot and his people go to the Jordan Valley. Um, if the Old Testament was first a movie before it was a book, um, there would be a scene where probably Lot and his people were very smugly walking off, uh, saying, see ya, uncle, uh, off uh, to the opulent and wealthy Jordan Valley. You know those old the, the signs that, you know, in, uh, that as you enter in a town where it says, welcome to Whoville, population, whatever, you know what I'm talking about? So the, the, the movie shot would be Lot and his people walking off smugly, but then the camera would just slowly pan over to the sign that said, welcome to Sodom and Gomorrah. And we would all go, oh, he chose poorly. But that doesn't actually come up into the next story that we're not going to get into today. But so Lot goes off to the five cities and settles there. He's got all of his stuff and everything's going great. But the five cities having lots of resources, what happens to areas that have lots of resources? They become places of conflict, right? Because other people want those resources. You just think of the Middle East and oil. They have tar. Everyone wants the tar. And so there's an alliance of four cities, uh, another, a different four cities, uh, who the, the chief king was King Chedorlaomer, which is even a more difficult name to say than Melchizedek. But uh, Chedorlaomer takes the armies of the four cities and wages war against the five cities of the Jordan Valley. And you might say five versus four, the five's going to win, but it doesn't work like that. The, the four cities have a larger army. It's better equipped. They're better trained. And they wipe the floor with the five cities. Uh, in fact, in one harrowing section of Genesis, they're driving the armies of the five cities back, and the soldiers start falling into the tar pits. And the other soldiers, who hadn't yet fallen into the tar pits, go, we don't want to fall into the tar pits. And so they retreat uh, to the hills. They leave. They run away, leaving the five cities completely defenseless. And so King Chedorlaomer and the armies of the four cities go in and take everything. They take all the resources, all the precious metals, all the precious jewels, all the cattle, all the sheep, and all the people to, in that era, to the victor belong the spoils, and Chedorlaomer was the victor, and so he got all the stuff. Abram hears that his nephew and his people have been taken captive by Chedorlaomer. And although Abram, you know, didn't leave on the best of terms with Lot, and Abram's people certainly didn't leave in the best of terms with Lot's people, they're still family. And so Abram pulls together this elite force of army rangers and navy seals and Episcopal priests. And I'm just kidding about the navy seals. Um, actually, I'm kidding about the whole thing because he doesn't have an elite fighting force. He has shepherds and herdsmen. So he pulls together 318 shepherds and herdsmen to go and fight the four armies of the four cities under King Chedorlaomer, which sounds terrible. It sounds like Abram's going to get wiped, right? Except Abram goes and wipes the floor with Chedorlaomer's armies and the armies of the four cities, completely decimates them. Abram then takes possession of all the stuff, all everything that had been plundered, all the precious metals, all the precious jewels, all the sheep, all the, uh, all the cattle, and all the people. And he then goes to a place called the Valley of Shaba, or uh, the Valley of the Kings. Today it's known as the Kidron Valley, which you may have heard of on the news at some point. Uh, the Valley of the Kings is this unique geo, uh, 
uh, logic feature where it's a wide valley. It's like, in fact, Shava could mean plain. It's like the, the plain valley. And so there's this wide, flat area, and then it's a valley, and so there's these steep walls on either side. And kings would meet there. They would, they, one would come in from one end, and one would come from the other, and they would feel safe going there because they couldn't be attacked by some marauding force because there's nowhere to hide. There's no other way into the valley. So it was a good place to do diplomacy. So Abram comes into the Valley of Kings, the Valley of Shava, with all the resources and all the people. And the king of Sodom comes in the other hand, one of the kings of the five cities. And the king of Sodom is shaking in his boots because Abram is the victor. His army of 318 shepherds beat the armies of the four cities. He has all, Abram's holding all the cards. And so while he's going in, the king of Sodom is preparing a speech in his head. And his speech is, dear Abram, sir, how about this? How about you keep all the stuff, all the plunder, all the precious things, just give me back my people, and we'll go back and figure it out. So they, they both come into the valley from either end, and they meet there. And you can imagine the place is electric with tension. You have uh, Abram's people who don't like Lot's people and vice versa. And now Abram's people own Lot and Lot's people. So there's that whole family dynamic going on. Then there's the uh, diplomatic uh, thing going on between Abram and the king of Sodom. You have the king of Sodom rehearsing that speech over and over in his head. Tension, fear, what's going to happen? And then comes into the valley, out of nowhere, the Melchizedek. Uh, how did the Melchizedek get there? It's a valley with only two entrances. How did, we don't know. He didn't come with Abram. He didn't come with the king of Sodom. He just sort of shows up. Melchizedek isn't really a name. It's kind of a, it's a title. Melchizedek literally means the king of righteousness, which is kind of a weird name. But okay, he's the king of righteousness. Uh, he's also called, right after his name, he's called the king of Salem, which is interesting because in 2500 BC, there is no record of any place being called Salem. There's no record of Salem existing anywhere on a map, certainly not a large enough city that would have a king. There wouldn't be a Salem for another 1,500 years when David would go to a place called Jerusalem. So he's this king with, like, no land. But Salem means something. Anybody know what Salem means? Salem? Shalom? He's the king of peace. So he's the king of righteousness. He's the king of peace. Uh, Genesis also introduces him as the priest of El Elyon, the priest of God Most High. Uh, in uh, the ancient Near East, there were a jillion gods on jillion shrines to all those little gods, but he's the priest of the chief god. Okay. And so into this fraught meeting with all the tension building, does he come with an army? No. Does he come with a peacekeeping force? That might be nice. No. He comes with bread and wine, which seems like a strange thing to bring. But apparently, then Abram sits down with the king of Sodom, who sits down, and Melchizedek, and they break bread, and they share a drink. And probably, while they're doing that, the king of Sodom, who's been re re rehearsing his speech, says, um, dear Mr. Abraham, Mr. Abram, sir, uh, I have an idea. How about you keep all the stuff? You keep all the precious stuff, all the valuable stuff, and just give me back my people, and we'll figure it out from there. And Abram says, no. He says, no. How about you keep all your stuff and all of your people? I don't want your stuff. As if the, 
as if to say, I didn't come to conquer you. Certainly I didn't come to conquer my kinsman, Lot. I came to free you. And so what, and the, the Melchizedek shows up. He's never been mentioned before in the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis never mentions him again. He sort of appears out of nowhere. A king with no land. But what he brings is reconciliation. He brings a sacred meal that brings people together and dissipates all of the anxiety and fear and anger and jealousy and all of that and reconciles Abraham, Abram to Lot and Abram to the five cities. And so you can imagine when the first Christians, the first followers of Jesus um, in, you know, in the first century, the second century, when they open the scroll of the book of Genesis and they hear that this enigmatic figure who just shows up and then disappears, who's the king of righteousness and the king of peace and the priest of the most high God who comes with bread and wine, who do the first Christians say that this enigmatic figure is? It's Christ. It's Jesus. In Hebrews, uh, the author to Hebrews doesn't quite come out and say it as clear as that. What he says is, Jesus is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. He's not a priest like Aaron, uh, the priests of the tabernacle or the temple, uh, who are like slaughtering animals and, uh, and, and killing things to... Uh, in, in sacrifice. He's a different kind of priest. He's a priest like Melchizedek was a priest bringing reconciliation. Jesus is like the Melchizedek who has come to reconcile us to God and to reconcile us to each other. Like the Melchizedek, Jesus comes with a sacred meal to bring us together under the banner of righteousness and peace in the name of of the Most High God, not to conquer, but to set free. And if, I mean, the author to the Hebrews invites us to see Jesus through the prism of the Melchizedek, this reconciler, and in a way invites us to see ourselves through that same prism. For if Jesus, the Melchizedek, is the bringer of reconciliation into the world. What are his followers meant to be, if not also ministers of reconciliation, bringing people together? Which sounds like a daunting task. It sounds like we have to know a lot. It sounds like we should have like a degree in this or something. It sounds like we should have like a plan or a course or a, like a, at least a nice sized booklet, <laughs> pamphlet to show us how to do this, but the Melchizedek doesn't have any of that. He just, the Melchizedek just comes with bread and wine and an invitation to sit down and share a meal. The Melchizedek doesn't give a plan. He literally sets the table so that reconciliation could happen. And my goodness, does the world need reconcilers today. Perhaps in some time, in some era, I don't know, I'd say that we all need to get up and go to some other place, some other land where there's like lots of conflict and troubles and issues going on and help them solve that. And you could do that. We could become foreign missionaries. But in this era, in this time, the conflict and the issues aren't just somewhere way over there. They're right here. And so are we. What would it take for you to see yourself as an agent of reconciliation? In your home, in your family, at work, in your, on, on your block, in your community, in our state and nation? And what would it take you to set the table 
to bring people together so that we can follow Jesus, the priest, after the order of Melchizedek. <laughs>